Go for it. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, as Nathan said, this is the third class that we have. Um, the last class we looked at the, the structure of the tabernacle, in particular the, the coverings and the pillars and the, what hold it, held it all up and how this was to be symbolic of our dwelling or God dwelling with men, that, uh, how God wanted to dwell with men and that this was to teach us how he was going to do it. Uh, this class, we're going to continue on that vein, but we're going to get into some of the details inside the tabernacle, uh, and particularly the altar of burnt offering, flavor, the table of showbread, the lampstand, the mercy seat, etc. So we'll get into those, but I'll go over a few of the basics that we um, talked about last week just to remind you before we get into the details. So first of all, the, the purpose of this all, Exodus chapter 25, which I mentioned just a second ago, Exodus 25 and verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God's purpose was to dwell with people. Um, the ultimate purpose in the end, Revelation chapter 21, never changed. We Revelation 21, we read, And verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, saw, and I John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And so we have in this tabernacle a representation of God's purpose to dwell with men on earth. And so this tabernacle teaches us how to come into his presence, particularly what we're going to talk about tonight is coming into the presence of God uh, through the, um, the, the, the symbols and the uh, types that we see in this tabernacle. So again, just a reminder that this tabernacle wasn't sort of the end all and be all. This was just a representation. Moses was told to go up on the mountain. God was going to show him a vision. He showed him a vision of, of a true tabernacle in heaven. Uh, we, if we look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 40, and look, Thou make them after the pattern which you were showed it, which was showed thee in the mount. Um, and so again, it was not a, a written instruction that was given to build this, but it was a picture. He was shown what it looked like. Um, he was shown the heavenly tabernacle, so to speak, which we read about in Hebrews chapter eight, where it says, "Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum." We have a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, seeing that, there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things of which Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, he said, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And so there was a heavenly tabernacle, so to speak, that Moses saw. And today we're going to look at more as, as well at that heavenly tabernacle, as well as this earthly tabernacle that we showed that Moses built, because there are a lot of scriptures that talk about the heavenly tab tabernacle. Um, and one place in particular that we read a lot about that is in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, we read, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a 
trumpet talking with me. And he said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And uh, John here was called up into heaven and he was uh, revealed a, a vision there. And we see that the vision he was revealed is in actuality that heavenly tabernacle. And we'll, we'll see as we go through the earthly tabernacle, the corresponding pieces in the heavenly tabernacle that John sees. But we'll do that as we go through the class tonight. Now, we saw a bit of this last week, but the camp in the wilderness, as I, as I had said, was, was a lesson to them as to how to approach unto God. And as they went through that camp, they were to be taught certain lessons. Um, as they came in basically around the whole camp in the wilderness, uh, as the children of Israel left the land of Egypt and were in the wilderness on their wanderings to the Holy Land, uh, obviously, all around them was wilderness. And then, you, if you were walking towards the center of that camp, first you'd come into the camp of Israel, where the 12 tribes were pitched all around uh, the, the tabernacle. And then as soon as you got through that camp of Israel, you would come into the camp of the priests and the Levites, who were centered around, directly around the tabernacle. And then you'd come through the, uh, the gate of the tabernacle into the court of the tabernacle. That's the place that uh, we'll see tonight had the altar of uh, burnt offering and the labor in it. You'd go through the next door and you'd be in the holy place where the lampstand was and the altar of incense and the table of showbread. <clears throat> Here on the, the priests could enter. And then there was a veil that separated them from the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat stood. So as we go through here, we'll see there's a progression that's very similar to our own progression. So uh, as they're in the wilderness, they're completely separated from God. If we go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 sort of describes that condition of being in the wilderness. It says, And at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And that's the condition of those who are in the wilderness, those who have not had any association with God and his covenants and his promises. They're in the wilderness. They are without hope. But as one comes towards the camp, they, um, their position changes. They hear the call of the gospel. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we read from verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear him who, without a preacher? And how shall they be preached except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so at some point they come into the camp of Israel or, or someone comes in association with the, the gospel of the, me the message of the gospel. And so they have the, the gospel preached unto them. And then they come next to the priests and the Levites and they seek the Lord or the law at his mouth. And Malachi chapter 2 talks us about the roles, the true role of the priests and the Levites, the one that they were supposed to uh, be playing. Malachi 2 and verse 4 said, And ye shall know that I have sent this, this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. And 
was afraid before my name. And the law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips, and he walked with me in peace and in equity, and did turn many away from their iniquities. For the priest's lips should uh, keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And so they come and they, they learn the ways of God from the, the priest. They, they're taught the ways uh, of knowledge, the, those things they need to know uh, in order to approach unto God. And so they come into the tabernacle. Uh, and coming into the tabernacle, and we'll see how this happens tonight, is similar to being baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6. six. Romans 6 and in verse 3 and 4. Know ye not that, all, <clears throat> that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so coming into the court of the tabernacle, and we'll show tonight how this is the case, is akin to being baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. And then you enter next into the holy place, and that's being in the, the church of God, into the ecclesia, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. And starting at verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. Ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. And so that's where... Uh, we come when we're in have been baptized into Christ and we're walking together with the ecclesia in the wilderness. We are in that holy place, but there comes a time that we're looking forward to when we come into the most holy place, revelation chapter 22. And this is a time that's still future for us, but we're looking forward to it greatly. Revelation 22 and verse three. <clears throat> And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night, and there no need for candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God hath given them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so in the presence of God, when we're fully living and dwelling in God's presence, in his kingdom, that's akin to being in the most holy place. And so the camp in the wilderness was an enacted parable of how to approach unto God. And so tonight we'll look at the details of this and how it teaches us how we are to approach unto God. So first of all, I'd like to just remind everyone the, uh, the layout that would happen. First of all, uh, if you look on the... Um, on the right where the arrow is, there's the curtain of the gate of the entrance gate into the tabernacle. You would first approach and come to the altar of burnt offering. Right beyond it, before the gate to the holy place where there was a laver, the bronze laver. Once you got inside that holy place, on the right side was the table of showbread, and on the uh, left side was the uh, the lampstand, and then right in front of the the veil was the altar of incense, and then on the other side of the veil was the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top of it, and so that's the approach unto God that uh, the the tabernacle shows us um, 
in parable uh, what it, how to get from outside the camp to to inside to the presence of God. Again, I'll remind people from last week some of the symbols that we had talked about, how we had gold and silver and, and bronze and how the gold represented the, the godly characteristics similar to the blue colors. The silver and the purple showed forth the, uh, the coming, the sort of intermediate between sort of the, the man and God, the, the redemption, the, the Christ. And then the bronze or red represented ourselves in terms of our fleshly characters, but particularly our, the bronze being our flesh being put to death. Uh, the shittim wood was the, uh, the, or acacia wood was the, the thorny wood that had the, sort of the, 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 the curse on it from the thorns, but it always was cleaned and had the curse removed and it was covered with gold. So it was us in a redeemed state. So so those uh, are the, the, we talked about these last week, but these are, those were the um, uh, symbols that we, we will be used, looking at. So once, once you go into the, uh, the tabernacle, the first item that one would see would be the altar of burnt offering. Uh, let's take a look at it from Exodus chapter 27. Exodus 27 and starting at the beginning. It tells us, and thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits, and thou shalt make horns upon it on the four corners thereof, and the horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass, and thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and the shovels, and the basins, and the flesh hooks, and the fire pans, and all the vessels, Thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make it for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net thou shalt make four brazen rings, and the four corners thereof, and thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, and thou shalt that the net may even be to the midst of the altar, and thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood overlaid with brass, and the stave shall put unto the rings, and the stave shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. And hollow with boards thou shalt make it as it was showed to thee in the mount, so shall you make, you make it. And so there was this altar of burnt offering, which was this glass covered shittim wood or acacia wood. Uh, it had its practical purpose for it has, it was, its purpose was for the burning of sacrifices. They would have a fire underneath it, and it would put their sacrifices upon it to burn them. But when we go to the symbolism of what this actually stood for, we don't have to guess, because the New Testament um, talks about what, about these things. Hebrews chapter 13 talks us about our sacrifices. Hebrews 13 and starting at verse 10. We have an altar where have, whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary, the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us, theref let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And so we see Jesus as our altar. And this whole uh, structure, again, is symbolic of Jesus in particular, his sacrifice, that the shittim wood, the the, the human nature, the cursed nature, 
covered with brass, that flesh put to death, was a symbol of Jesus. And in it, it is our way to enter into the, the holy place, as we need to enter into Christ's sacrifice. We need to participate in his death, as we read earlier, but we'll turn again to Romans chapter 6, that Jesus' death is our way in, and we need to participate in it. Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Verse 1, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism through death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the like, be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Henceforth, we should not serve sin. And so we need to participate in that sacrifice of Christ, in that death of Christ. And this altar of a burnt offering is that symbolism for that. And it is the way into uh, the, the first step into that. Uh, once you've come to the tabernacle, the first step to getting to the, the, the presence of God. But we have to remember that the uh, participation in Christ's sacrifice is not a, a one-time event. It's not a matter of just entering the waters of baptism. As it's been said, that Christ died on the cross, but his whole life was a sacrifice uh, of, of obedience to God. We also, in once, uh, enter the waters of baptism, but we come out and we crucify the death flesh daily. We need to take up our cross and follow him. Therefore, we participate daily in his sacrifice, looking forward to that day when our flesh is finally put off of us and we are given newness of life, life everlasting. Now this um, altar that we that they were to see was a, a, only a representation. For we, are, we read several places about when people are given visions of the true tabernacle, there's an altar there as well. Isaiah chapter 6 is one place where Isaiah had a vision of that heavenly tabernacle. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1. We read about Isaiah's vision where he sees the heavenly tabernacle. It says in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. But if we go down to verse uh, 5, we read, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am, a un I am unclean, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, and the Lord of hosts. And then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken from the, with the tongs from off the altar. And so Isaiah is in this vision of the throne of God. There is the altar there as well. Similarly, if we turn to Revelation and chapter 6, we saw how in, in Revelation chapter 4, John was caught up and was shown a vision in heaven where we'll see in a minute again he sees the throne of God. But in chapter 6, verse 9, he says, He opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And so in this play, John had his vision, this tabernacle in heaven, this heavenly tabernacle. He also saw this altar. So there were two items outside the building of the tabernacle in the courtyard. The first was the, the altar of burnt offering, and the second was the laver. The laver we read about in Exodus chapter 30.
Exodus chapter 30. And starting at verse 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Thou shalt make a labor of brass, and of his foot thou shalt make brass, and wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein, and Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat, and they shall go into the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall wash with water, that they die not. And when they come near unto the altar to minister, to burn offering, to make fire unto the Lord, and they shall wash their hands and their feet, and they sh that they shall die not, and it shall be a staff for them, even to me and to his seed throughout their generations. And so there was this labor, and it was fully made of brass, uh, that was for the purpose was for washing, for cleaning, for cleansing. Um, and so it was fully brass, fully that flesh put to death, filled with water, which speaks again loudly of baptism, um, which we can read about in Acts chapter 22. Acts 22 says, in the act of baptism, there's more to it than just baptism. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And it said, Why now tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. And wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And so the baptism was not just the, the physical act of washing, but it was the forgiveness, sim symbolic of this forgiveness of sins, and the calling or taking upon us the name of God to be one of his children. And so, um, the alt but as the altar had it, and uh, uh, it was symbolic of an immediate thing as well as a continuing one, so does the labor. Because there's a continual act of washing that's required. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26 tells us, he says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And so <clears throat> there's a sanctifying and cleansing of us by the washing of the water of the word, that the word of God will continually cleanse and wash us. If we continue to take it in. John chapter 15. And verse 3 tells us, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And so again, the clean, cleansing nature of the word of God, which inf influences our minds. Psalm 119 speaks of this, this as well. Psalm 119, and we'll look at verse 9. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. And in verse 11 again. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So God's word, as well as just the physical water, God's word has a cleansing uh, aspect to our, to our natures and to our souls to, to cleanse us from unrighteousness and keep us from sin. Now, as we saw the altar of burnt offering inside the true heavenly tabernacle, we see also the labor inside the true tabernacle. If we go to Revelation chapter 4, this is again John's vision of the heavenly tabernacle. And in verse 6, he says, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So this sea of glass, and we, uh, we can understand that to be similar labor. Uh, if we, we won't turn there, but if you look at uh, 1 Kings 7, it's a description of, of Solomon's temple. Uh, the, the labor in Solomon's temple was called the Bronze Sea. And here we have the sea of glass, which is uh, 
this this gives us the same symbol of the labor here now in the true tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle. Moving on to the table of the showbread. Um, yes. What chapter in, in Exodus was the Solomon's bronze thing? That was, it was in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 23. Thanks. So once we get inside the tabernacle, as we pointed out last week, everything changes. It's no longer covered with brass. It's now all covered with gold. And so uh, once we've come through and we've crucified the flesh, we've put the flesh to death, now we are showing forth God's character. And so we are inside that tabernacle. Um, uh, we've participated in the sacrifice of Christ. We've been baptized. We've been cleansed by his word. Now we're inside the tabernacle. Um, so there's this table of showbread, which we read about in Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25 and starting at verse 23 gives us this, the description. And thou shalt make a table of shittim wood, two cubits it shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and, the, and make thereof a crown round about it. And it goes on to describe how this table was to be made and how it was to have poles. The intent, though, was to have on this table continually 12 loaves of bread, as is shown in the picture. Um, and at the end of each week, those, that bread was changed, and the priests were then to take and eat that bread. And um, so this was the bread of the presence. It was the bread that was in the presence of God, which was to replace, be replaced regularly and eaten by, by the priests. And so we have here, again, a symbol of uh, shittim wood covered with gold. So human uh, people who have been uh, transformed by God's character. And here we have uh, a food that was to be regularly partaken of, food that was in the presence of God. So this was a symbolic meal of fellowship between God and the priests. That Every week they would uh, have a fellowship meal with, uh, in the presence of God. And so this table was to have a crown around it, like a crown of righteousness that is talked about in Timothy, laid up for those who overcome. So this is, rep is for us, can represent the, the saints, uh, the bread of the, the presence, which is partaken of the priests, re represents the fellowship that we have on a weekly basis with God by partaking of bread. And we know that Christ was the two true bread that came out of heaven, and our fellowship always comes through him. So we see... Um, again, another symbol of, of God's, uh, of our, now that we're inside the, the tabernacle, a symbol of our, our life once we are in Christ, once we've been baptized into Christ. And the first aspect of this is fellowship with God, particularly in the breaking of bread. Now, this is one aspect that um, if you go to the visions of the heavenly um, tabernacle uh, it's hard to find a direct reference it says the heavenly tabernacle had this table of showbread in it but in my opinion this heavenly uh, this table of showbread or, or more specifically the 12 loaves of bread are represented in John's vision uh, in chapter 4 of Revelation when it talks about and around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So this table had a crown of gold around it. These twenty-four elders had crowns of gold on their head, and they sat around the throne. 
Now, the one difference here is in Revelation, there's 24 elders, and on this table, there's only 12 loaves of bread. And my guess at why that is, is because this table was a Jewish table. It was represented the Jews um, and their fellowship with God. But when we get to the true tabernacle, both Jew and Gentile have fellowship with God. And so instead of 12, there's now 24 to represent the, both the Jew and the Gentile having fellowship with God. On the opposite side of the tabernacle was the golden lampstand. Uh, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31 gives us the description of it. Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold of beaten work, and shall be the candlestick shall be uh, of beaten work shall be the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, his flowers shall all be the same. The six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three of the other side. And it goes on to to explain that in more detail. Um, there's several passages that tell us what, uh, what this represented, but we'll go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse that many are probably familiar with, and verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, unlike the, the table of showbread, the, which represented us and our fellowship with God, the, the source of the light is wholly golden. It's holy from God. It's all from God. It's pure gold. It does not have a man, the source of man in it. It is a light unto man, but it is from God. And, and so, therefore, the candlestick was made of pure gold and was... Uh, uh, it was uh, to be the light unto men. First uh, John, or John chapter one, tells us about the representation in the New Testament. John chapter one and verse fourteen. It says. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spake again, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of men. And so this light of the world was perfectly manifested in Jesus. Uh, but we also have a place in showing forth that light unto men, that it's not, um, it sh that light should be reflected in us. Because uh, Matthew 5 tells us, Matthew 5 and verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And also John chapter 15. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that breaketh, beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that he may bring forth more fruit. And so as the, the lampstand was to be a trunk with branches on it, it, Jesus talks about us being the branches and him being the vine. So uh, again, if we go to Revelation chapter 4, we again see the light present in the true and heavenly tabernacle. Verse 5, 
And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So seven lamps, as the lampstand had seven heads, there were seven lamps. And so we can again see that the, the depiction that was built in the wilderness was, was made to represent something that, that John was seeing here and that Isaiah had seen earlier, the true and heavenly tabernacle. The next piece was the altar of incense. Um, so back to, we'll go back uh, the, to, to, to the light. We see again, this is inside the tabernacle. Once someone has come in um, to uh, baptized into Christ, become part of God's family, we saw the, the fellowship, the table of fellowship, part of their, their regular uh, worship. Now we see the, the light, the, the, the word of God as part of their regular um, service to God and part of their regular um, uh, workings as a, a Christian in, in the church of God. The third aspect inside this room is the altar of incense, which we read about in Exodus chapter 30. <coughs> Exodus 30, starting at verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar of burnt incense upon, upon to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood thou shalt make it, a cubit thou shalt shall be the length and a cubit the breadth thereof four square shall it be two cubits shall be its height thereof and the horns thereof shall be the same and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold the top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof thou shalt make it a crown of gold around about it and again we've seen that symbol before the the shittim wood the acacia wood covered in gold and we know that's talking about us the those who Again, the, the men of flesh who have put on the, the gold covering of God, um, so symbolic of the redeemed saints. Its purpose in the, in the tabernacle was for burning of incense. And if we go back to Revelation, we see what the burning of incense represented. Chapter 8 and verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer thereof, and was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And again, here we see that in this heavenly tabernacle, there is this altar of incense, and it was to burn saints, which was, or to burn incense, which was the prayers of all the saints. Chapter 9, verse 13 says again, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the horns of the golden altar of incense, which is before God. And so this incense that was burned was representative of the prayers of the saints going up to God. Before anyone came into his presence who came to God, there was prayer that was to be offered. And so right now at this time, this altar of incense was the closest, is the closest we could get to God. It was the closest they could get to God. It was right outside the veil. They could not go through that veil in the most holy place. And so the altar of incense was the closest they could get to God. And right now it's the same for us. The closest we get to God is through to Him. It's all incense presents our prayers be as we can now we uh, do that through prayer which this altar represented now finally and I left this slide out of the the handout so you won't have this I'm sorry I um, had pulled it out for uh, another class I was giving and I forgot to stick it back in the final thing inside this, the, the, the tabernacle was that piece of, of furniture, if you want to call it that, on the other side of the veil, which was the Ark of the Covenant. Um, we won't look at in detail, or we won't turn up in Exodus the, the description, but again, we find 
two main elements made to make this Ark of the Covenant. The bottom portion of the Ark was basically a box, a box made out of shittim wood again and covered with gold. The top of, of it was made out of solid gold and it had, it was essentially paper or lid for the box and it had on top of it two carabim. And that uh, place on top, that piece on top is called the mercy seat. Um, it's a, uh, it was basically what it says. It was a lid that had these uh, two carabim that had these wings that touched each other in the middle as shown in the picture. Um, the box itself had three things inside of it. Uh, we were told that they put a, a container of, ma of manna inside the box. They put Aaron's rod that budded inside the box. And they put the, ten, the tablets on which the, the Ten Commandments were written. Those were inside the box as well. And so this is a, a sort of a the critical piece in the whole, uh, whole uh, fabrication. Because this was where the dwelling of God was. Uh, there's many places in the Bible where it talks about God and describes him as, as he that dwells between the cherubim. And when it talks about God who dwells between the cherubim, he, um, they're talking about this, this Ark of the Covenant and that God dwelt between the cherubim. We need to be careful when we, we call that place on top of the Ark the mercy seat, because that's that's the term the Bible uses, but seat is a little um, misleading because get the, if we if we have that term in our mind, we get the impression that God sat down there, but that's not at all the meaning of the word mercy seat. It's really the place of mercy. It has nothing to do with sitting down or a seat. It's the place where mercy was, um, it, and the and that's what the description was. Because without God's mercy, we could never meet with him. And the box underneath, that's more symbolic of us. We are, again, that shittim wood, that fleshly cursed wood that was covered with gold to make, be made beautiful. Um, inside of us, we had the manna. And the manna was... Um, representative of, of God's sustenance, that we are sustained purely by God. Without him, we have no life. The Aaron's rod which budded was a symbol that God had chosen Aaron. And so similarly, the rod that budded means that we were chosen by God. And thirdly, the Ten Commandments were God's word. And so God's word is in us. And so here we have those who are sustained by God and chosen by God, kept alive by his word inside this box. And on top of that is pure gold, this pure gold mercy seat, this place of mercy that allows God to dwell, basically to meet with us, to dwell in our presence. Um, we know that that is uh, representative of, of Christ, who was that pure gold, who perfectly showed God's character. And without him, we have no mercy uh, from God. So we have in this picture here, the sort of culmination of God's plan of him dwelling with us. And we have in symbol here how he wants to dwell with us, with Christ between us and his dwelling, with us being being sustained by him, being chosen by him, and having his word within us, that we in that manner can come together with God. As it talks about in the, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, Matthew 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so that's uh, in verse 8 of 
of Matthew 5. So if we want to be in the presence of God, to see God, this symbol of the tabernacle shows us the steps that we need to get to, to be there, to be in that place that we all long for, to be full with glory, just like this uh, tabernacle is filled with God's glory. Because that was the end. When Moses finished building this tabernacle, God's presence and God's glory filled the building. Um, similarly, when Solomon built his temple, God's uh, glory filled it. So you've seen the steps and the lessons for our life depicted in this tabernacle. In the outer court, we saw how Christ sacrificed. Uh, we, it, we had to participate in Christ's sacrifice and have a conversion of our mind that was, sim that was symbolized in baptism. We saw in the holy place the aspects of leisure life, fellowship with God, God's word within us, and prayer to God, which bring us close to God. But finally, inside the holy place, we dwell with God. And so we see completed in this tabernacle our steps to coming together with God and how we as his children need to act in order to dwell with God. And so we see that the, the tabernacle was this uh, an acted parable, so to speak. Um, it's not just a, uh, a, a structure to figure out what it looked like. It's not an academic study to figure out how it was built, but it's a lesson that teaches us how God's glory can shine in our lives. So that's uh, the class for tonight, so I'll open it up for questions. Did you say anything about the cherubim with the ark? Sorry, that? I didn't hear that. that. Say what you thought the cherubim were as regard to the Ark of the Covenant? I think the cherubim represent different, um, from, from other descriptions of the cherubim, we know they had four faces. They had the face of an ox, the face of a, an eagle, uh, the face of a man, and the face of a lion on, on them. How that actually looked, we don't really know, but we know that they, they did have those four faces, and I think they represent our different types of service um, to, in our, our service to God. Um, the, the ox being the, the servant, the uh, eagle being sort of the, uh, um, the spirit or the uh, um, more spiritual aspects, the uh, ox being more the, the manual aspects, the, the uh, law, Lion being rulership or kingship that, that we will share with Christ and man, um, representing um, our, ourselves or that these are, are part of us in our lives. So um, I see that as uh, the, the cherubim being the, those, uh, that service to God represented, that was represented or followed or by as an, as an example, by as uh, by Christ, and for us to follow in His stead. Then also, could the twelve extra elders, the first being the um, children of Israel and the, the tribes, but could possibly the second twelve be the disciples, which? are going to sit on thrones, and also they had to do with taking the gospel to the Gentiles? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a, a good um, uh, comparison, is that the, the first 12 are representative of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the second 12, the, the, the disciples who took the, the gospel out to the Gentiles. Um, you get to the end, we read Exodus, or Revelation 21 about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, being a, the dwelling of God with men. 
And on that new Jerusalem, it's described as the, um, the foundation stones being the 12 apostles and the, the gates being the 12 tribes. Those stones are, um, or that image of God's dwelling have those same pieces in it later. And then one last thing, I really liked what you said about Revelation 6, 9, which has the um, altar and underneath it, the souls of those who have been slain. And I always thought that was a curious phrase, but the way you describe it as the altar represents Jesus' sacrifice and then, so it then similarly represents other people who were sacrificed for the sake of the gospel is that how you would see that? Or? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to look at it. I mean, the it's um, that altar was is our participation in Christ's sacrifice, so it's their participation. Um, those in in Revelation, particularly, um, uh, underwent a, a physical persecution. Um, for us, it, it may be more of a spiritual uh, sacrifice in terms of sacrificing our own desires and our own will to follow the will of God. But uh, I think a little more, um, it was a little more uh, exacting for those that are talked about in Revelation. But it's still the same concept that we are sacrificing our lives to, um, to serve our Father. Uh, I had a question. Um, the sound cut in and out just a little bit when you were talking about the altar of incense, and I think you said that this was the closest that one could approach to God. Now, not the high priest, of course, because the high priest once a year could go into the Holy Holies. But you mean everybody else, all the other priests. Right. The high priest only once a year could enter into the the holy, most holy place, and even then he could only do that once he's, he had filled that place with smoke and incense, so he really was, was in there, but he was somewhat blind in there because the whole place was filled with smoke when he was in there, but anyone else who came into that tabernacle, if they wanted to get as close as they could to the, the Ark of the Covenant, that would be at the altar of incense. So would a New Testament parallel be, uh, I can't remember the scripture in Hebrews, it says, you know, that we have a high priest that can be touched with our infirmities, and then it says, therefore, come boldly before the throne of grace that you may be able to obtain help in a time of trouble. So you're thinking that then maybe is come, come to the altar of incense, that's as far as you can go? I think so. I think um, I mean, in Hebrews when it says we can come boldly to the the throne that's saying we, we we have a high priest who the veil has been torn for him so he's gone inside there already so to speak and we are promised that we also uh in in the in the coming day we will also be able to uh, go inside there and so there's the promise that we have the um can come boldly to that throne um but it's uh uh, right now, in our present existence, we can't go into the presence of God, and therefore, through the altar of incense is as far as we can get, which is our prayers to God. That's as close as we can get to the presence of God right now. Okay. And uh, could the Jews have been like, go into the holy place? Or what's, you know... Did they just stay in the courtyard? Uh, they could only go into the courtyard. It was only the priests that were able to go into the holy place. Well, they never even saw what it looked like in there or what was going on in there? Other than the descriptions of either the priests or the uh, from the law, they would, uh, they would only know from hearing about it. But... The uh, sort of corresponding thing today is that he he says that he will make us kings and priests. So we are we are 
right now have the sort of spiritual spiritual right as kings and priests to be in that holy place. Um, what, what's your take on Revelation four five uh, comparing the menorah the seven you know uh, seven stick candelabra? And then it says those seven heads are the seven spirits of God. What are the seven spirits of God? I don't get that part. I think the, the spirits of God, um, um, it talks um, earlier in Hebrews, it talks about the angels being ministering spirits. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how the angels were given, given the task of, of presenting God's word to men, that the, the, the word of God was presented to, to the men of old by the angels, and they were the spirits of God that came to deliver um, God's word unto men. Uh, ministering, uh, chapter 1, verse 14 of Hebrews, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them that shall be heirs of salvation? And so when it talks about those, I think it's the same symbol as we have it's it's the light of God's word that's going forth, and that's the the spirits are those going forth to minister that word to to the to those around, and so they have that same symbol of, of the light light of God's word going forth from those lamps. Okay, you also brought up in that same section on the golden lampstand, John one fourteen, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse 1, and then 14, and the Word that was God became flesh and dwelt among us. So, but that doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't uh, half off, right? Right. I mean, if we, we go a little more closely into John 1, uh, it talks about, um, where was it? Back in verse 9, that, he talks about the, uh, that he was the true light and the light in every man that comes into the world. He, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, and he came of his own. And so Jesus was that light, and I think that's where I, I, I meant to follow that in, and that light of God's word um, was was made flesh in Jesus and showed forth God's light. Um, but the idea that uh, the word was God in the beginning um, is, is reference to God's plan in the beginning that he had, which in Christ that plan became a reality. Um, that plan, that word, was uh, um, came into being in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, the horns of the altar, I think there are some scriptures that say bind the sacrifice to the horns of the altar, and does that mean, you know, these are live animals that have to be taken and thrown on this burning altar, and they take ropes and they, they, they bind it down, it, or is the animal already dead and they just burn it on the altar? The animal's already dead, so in any of the sacrifices, the, the the one coming to present the sacrifice uh, had to actually slay the animal. So it's uh, we will uh, we're not going to be getting into the sacrifices so much in this study. But the 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 way they would go about it is he was coming to present his offering. He would put his hands on the offering and slay the offering by with by literally th slitting its throat. Uh, they would drain the blood of it and then they would. Uh, burn it on the altar, um, depending on the type of of the uh, um, of the sacrifice. There's different rules and regulations, but so the horns of the altar were, um, yeah, they weren't to tie something down to the altar per se. Um, they were projections on the four corners, um, but what their actual purpose was in terms of a practical 
aspect. I'm not sure if, if they had one other than um, just as a, uh, a feature of the altar. Uh, okay, and the last question, Revelation 4, uh, I've been taught or thought that that was the rapture, you know, after this, he said, come up hither and I will show you things that shall come hereafter. Um, you don't have that take on it, probably? No, I mean, John, um, it, it is a vision, but it's um, what John was shown and throughout Revelation is um, glimpses into what is uh, the throne of God, this uh, true tabernacle in heaven, which we see at the very end of the book, uh, the ch chapter 21, the dwelling place of God in heaven is coming down to be with men. And so we have um, this, uh, this vision that, that John has been given of what uh, his, is happening in heaven and um, uh, all these things that are going on are these uh, throughout the book, the, the seals and the trumpets and the, the vials, those are things that are happening on earth that have been happening since the time of Christ until now. And so we have sort of this play as in the book of Revelation between what's going on in heaven and what's going on on earth. And John is given a glimpse into what's going on in heaven while these things are happening on earth. Uh, but the, the ultimate end of the book of Revelation is that that dwelling place of God that they, John sees in verse chapter 4 comes down to earth so that God is now, as we read, um, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. So that that uh, true tabernacle the throne of God comes down from heaven is with, with men at the, the end of Revelation. Yeah, and if I could chime in, I had a semester class in Revelation, and Kurt's absolutely right. Uh, the professor was an evangelical scholar, and he said no scholar in the world believes this point of literature because it's not a It's a chronological story. This is the beginning of the story. We pass through from the present, the church is going on. Now you're being seen a vision and seeing what's going to happen in the future. This is chapter 4, chapter 21 is the end. No, <laughs> this is not there. But, and no one, very, very, no one said this there, basically, in the academic world, is what we are doing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank everybody for their questions. I know we've gone a little long tonight, but uh, next week we're going to look at the the feasts, the, the five uh, or seven, actually seven feasts that are in the law, and how they form a parable for our spiritual journey as well. So we'll go, go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Our, word, our God and Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us words of instruction, words of enlightenment. Help us to walk in the ways that you've set before us, that we might go in that way that is everlasting, that way that leads to you, that we might be in your presence, that we might see you, that we might have you dwell among us. We look for and long for that time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Kurt.